In the morning of man, Australia waited. An ancient land made by hand and peopled by the spirits of the dream time. In that time, this world was home to creatures weird and wondrous, spirit beings who dreamed into creation all things that swarm on land or sea. Join us on a journey into a world of living wonders, a journey back through time to the mysterious land that lies at the ends of the earth. Australia, the island continent, its lonely western reaches long resisted settlement and still today hold mysteries and surprises, a history hidden in its silent shores and sun-bleached rocks. A land three times the size of Texas, Western Australia is a world unto itself, a place created, so it seems, by savage spirits gone berserk. Here, the passage of long eons of time, aided by the patient work of wind and weather, has made a landscape unlike any other on the earth a place where the past is read in the signs carved by nature and by man upon the rocks. In the time of dreaming, all that swam, that crawled, that flew, first came into being. And in the sacred caves where ancient spirits still are said to dwell, the record of that long lost time remains for knowing eyes to read. To those who made these drawings, the rainbow serpent, Wybal, was the creator of the world the spirit force that spawned both beasts and man. The graffiti of the Aborigines recalls a golden age when nature ruled in harmony with man. Here, the stones the artists used to grind their colors lie nearby the weathered bones, which are their last remains. Remnants themselves of a bygone time, the flightless emus stalk the sun-drenched wastes of Western Australia. Like many of Australia's wild creatures, the emus evolved here, the proud products of millennia of splendid isolation. Wallaby is a smaller relative of the kangaroo, and like the kangaroo, it plays an honored role as a spirit brother of the Aborigines. The same is true of the quokka, another of Australia's unique kangaroo-like marsupials. The aptly named horny devil haunts the arid outback a crusty, carnivorous lizard that is the terror of termites and ants. With its hot, dry climate, Western Australia is a paradise for reptiles, among them the goanna, part of a pantheon of remarkable lizards that range in form from the beautiful to the bizarre.
The Frilled Lizard is a true Australian original, outfitted with a magnificent collar which it raises when alarmed. Each summer, from the clouds, the lightning men rain bolts of fire upon the bone-dry grasslands of Australia. Yet in the work of fire and flood, the land is born anew, shaped to suit the needs of those who, from the dawn of time, have made their homes here. In Aboriginal lore, all the places of this land are hallowed ground, a home to gods and guardian spirits. The Brolga is a totem to the members of its clan, as is the Jabiru. And to harm a feather of such a spirit beast would be to harm an ancestor, a protector of the clan. with spirits large and small. Every life is valued. Every creature is a brother or a sister, a companion on the endless journey shared by all creation. Even the great saltwater crocodile, one of the most voracious predators on Earth, is revered by the Aborigines and valued for its place in the grand scheme of being. With difficulty, modern Australians have learned to live with the monsters. And after years of brutal conflict between our species, a way has been found to benefit both through the innovation of crocodile farming. of kangaroo meat keep the crocodiles fat and content at this farm in northern Australia, an enterprise which thrives on the lucrative international trade in crocodile hides. Tamed and turned into farmyard animals, the once fierce hunters now subsist on a diet of handouts, a lifestyle they will enjoy until the day comes, as it must, when they are turned into handbags and belts. The crocodile farm is a major attraction, a magnet that draws the few visitors who stop at this dot on a tourist map. Fenced enclosures protect the visitors from close encounters with the crocs, who would, without hesitation, nip off a hand that got too close to their mouths.
Rearing crocodiles has been raised to the status of a science in this region of northern Australia. And for the fledgling crocs, the adventure begins in the nursery. These hatchlings will be pampered and coddled throughout their lives. Weighed, measured, and monitored as they develop, they will be identified at a glance from their siblings by the scales painlessly snipped from their spines. In Aboriginal lore, the spirits were not meant to be farmed, and woe befalls those who would sever the bond with the wild. Whether savage predators or objects of trade and commerce, the restless wild spirits still stir in this backwater of Western Australia. Along Australia's southwest coast, sandy shores give way to icy seas and frowning granite ramparts, a landscape reminiscent of America's wild northwest. Beneath the turbulent surface lies a shadowy world of wonders, a shifting, surging sea of grass and underwater Everglades. The seagrass swamp is the haunt of the secretive Port Jackson shark, a camouflage-coated bottom dweller that subsists on mollusks and crustaceans. Swaddled in an egg case screwed into a crevice in the rocks, an infant Port Jackson shark waits to enter the world. Among the denizens of the swamp, camouflage is an art, from the stripes of the blue-spotted pufferfish to the grassy green of the brownfield's wrasse. An octopus finds the maze of grass a perfect place to hide. The beds, in fact, are an ideal home for stalkers and for sulkers, sedentary species like the marbled flathead and cryptically colored juveniles, wary of the open waters. For protection from predators, a sea snail shrouds its body in a mantle of living algae while tiny anemones, anchored to the seagrass, strain the rich tidal soup. The deadly, the beautiful, and the bizarre co-mingle here in a world of strange sea spirits. The sea dragon is one of Australia's true natural oddities, a fish that has assumed the form of a drifting piece of flotsam, complete with leaves and a twig-like snout. To guard the precious eggs its mate has laid, this male carries them fixed in place along the underside of its tail. Like a delicate jeweled ornament, a juvenile dragon drifts through its world, 
lending mystery and magic to the dark southern sea. Fierce tempests and storms swirl ceaselessly over these meadows, and all life here must bend or be broken by the brutal assault of the Furies. to spawning, all the routines of life on the seabed are attuned to the dictates of current and tide. And to adapt to this world of extremes, some animals have assumed astonishing forms. Despite appearances, the sea squirt is a living animal that sweeps the sea for food. So is the golf ball anemone, a predator laying in wait for its prey. Secure in their stalks made of mud and sand, a colony of tube worms stretches flowery tentacles to snatch morsels from the passing storm as all of life reels and sways to the surging dance of the tides. A black-spotted cat shark hurries for shelter. One of the most primitive of all living sharks, it seeks safety in crevices and crannies where it sulks in the shadows. Like the cat shark, the estuary catfish hugs the bottom, its speckled coat a perfect match for the mottled rocks where it hides and hunts its prey. On silent wings, the smooth stingray, the stealth bomber of the deep, soars across the sunken meadows, stalking the small sea creatures that seek shelter there. But a far more deadly predator now stalks the world of the seagrass, threatening all of the life that thrives there. Marine biologist Hugh Kirkman is on the trail of a killer. To Kirkman's distress, he has found that great swaths of the green meadows are dying, their stalks gnawed through at the roots, their blades encrusted with epiphytes which choke off the sunlight needed to maintain the life-giving work of photosynthesis. One of the culprits in this grim scenario is the sea urchin, which has descended in hordes on the meadows, munching its way through the stalks and leaving drifting debris in its wake. Within the stomach of an urchin is the evidence of gluttony run amok, the half-digested remains of young grass stalks destroyed in their prime. The death of the seagrass is the death of an entire community of creatures who once made these meadows their home, a tragedy whose ultimate cause was long a mystery to sleuths like Kirkman. But a close look at the evidence pointed to the probable culprits. In recent years, heavy metal refineries and other industries on shore have increased the discharge of nutrient-laden chemicals into the sea, 
causing an explosion in the population of epiphytes and urchins, both of which threaten the seagrass. The needs of agriculture have increased the demand for chemical fertilizers, which in time find their way to the shore, while the opening of the coast to settlement has increased the quantity of human wastes discharged into the sea. Yet one of the killers that thrives on pollutants, the mossy green alga that carpets the seafloor and crowds the grass for space, may have met its match. A commercial harvester now works the weed beds, sucking up the algae with a giant vacuum hose. On the bottom, an intake nozzle rakes the beds, sluicing in the weeds while leaving the seagrass intact. The rich green harvest will supply tons of nutritious cattle feed and freed of the occasional fish sucked aboard, it will provide a cheap source of fertilizers, organic fertilizers, to reduce the demand for pollution producing chemicals. By reducing agricultural and industrial effluence, while ridding the seabed of weeds, the Western Australians have taken the first steps towards saving a neglected natural resource, one of Australia's great wild treasures, the wondrous world of the seagrass. The western edge of Australia is washed by the warm waters of a tropical current which sweeps south from the sultry climes of the Indian Ocean. Along this coast, the Aborigines left their indelible mark, depicting the sea creatures they caught and the spirits they worshipped. Aboriginal lore embraced every sea-dwelling creature, and the sea, like the land, was a magical place made for man's pleasure and use by the shadowy spirits of the dream time. The corals of Ningaloo Reef off Australia's northwest cape were the stepping stones of the spirits, part of a world as hallowed to the coastal tribes as any sacred site on land. A great forest of corals clothes the reef, comprising dozens of species all told, each using the sea and its riches in its own unique way. Thorny gardens of stone form a labyrinth in which small creatures can hide, a habitat of intricate complexity and shadowy, surreal splendor. Through this otherworldly realm swim fish of myriad species, all dependent on the reef and its resources for their livelihood. To the ancients, these were magic beings, 
the sisters and the brothers of mankind. And for that reason, they were honored and protected. Here, tropical species like the trumpet fish and the raccoon butterfly fish join others like the shy porcupine puffer fish, each with its own role to play in the coral community. Undisturbed by a territorial butterfly fish, a rainbow-hued parrotfish naps in the coral, while a close relative, more conservatively colored, blends beautifully into the rock. In every canyon, every hidden valley, the reef throngs with life. From stunning fish to startling nudibranchs, the colorful cousins of the snails, the creatures of the reef are ceaselessly astir, seeking shelter, seeking prey. The green sea turtle shares the world of the reef with the whale shark, at 30 feet, the biggest fish in the sea. Another monster, the giant manta, patrols the coral heads its gaping maw sweeping in the plankton and the tiny fish on which it feeds. The coral itself is prey to the parrotfish, which feed voraciously on the living polyps, nipping off morsels with their powerful parrot-like beaks. In the long run, very little damage is done to the reef by the parrotfish, which feed briefly, then move on. But while the parrotfish feeds, a subtler, more sinister killer casts a grim pall over the world of the coral. Drupella cornus, a small purple sea snail, is inch by inch laying waste to the reef. To a casual glance, the corals look healthy, but then one spots the purple hordes, the hungry legions closing for the kill. Behind them lie dead corals, the patient work of centuries destroyed. Stripped of its living mantle, the reef reverts to barren rock, a graveyard blanketed in ghostly algae, a no-man's land, inhospitable to all but the most hardy forms of life. decade, more than two-thirds of Ningaloo Reef, sacred ground to the ancient coastal tribes, has been irreparably destroyed, a consequence of a conjunction of forces that no one understands. In fact, all that is known for certain is that on this reef, something has somehow gone frightfully out of balance. An investigation of the Drupella Plague is underway at the Western Australia Marine Research Laboratories at Perth. Marine biologist Stephanie Turner is studying the life history of the snails, seeking clues to the catastrophe that has befallen the reef.
By breeding snails in the laboratory, she has begun to understand some of the intimate details of their lives, details which may help to explain why their population has suddenly surged recklessly out of control. The culprit, a larval snail smaller than the head of a pin, equipped with wings which help it to colonize vast tracts of the coral. While some speak of vengeful spirits, many scientists suspect that the snail onslaught is a natural occurrence, a cyclical event which simply must be endured until the reef returns once again to flourish in all its splendor. Land's End in Southwest Australia a world of ragged cliffs and storm-racked seas. The last stop before Antarctica. Here, if anywhere on this earth, is a fitting place for monsters. Whales have visited this coast since long before the memory of man long before the ancient owners of this land learned to honor and revere them and to prize them for their meat. According to a tribal legend, it was a giant whale that made the southern ocean and with the great creation shark fashioned all the life within it. Their dominion unchallenged, the Leviathans for long millennia reveled in these cold, rich waters. And in that long ago, no man or beast could know that one day a far more fearful force would bring destruction on their world. When it closed in 1978, this was the last whaling station on the Australian continent. It was not sentiment that closed the station. There were too few whales still left alive to clear a profit on the kill. On this grinding wheel, now rusted flensing knives were sharpened till they shone, while left where they last were used, a grim collection of killing tools testifies to a way of life and a way of death which now belongs to history. A boneyard of bent instruments of destruction waits to rust away, while in a nearby shed, the parched remains of the whaler's prey cause children on school tours to pause a moment and to wonder what beasts these were that once coursed through the sea. Offshore, the last whale chaser rests, her engine silent and her decks deserted by the men who daily put to sea upon her to do battle with the whales. Now, as if in retribution, the sister of the whaling ship lies offshore where she sunk, attracting divers eager to explore a dark, uncharted world, the haunted world of long drowned ships.
20 years in these rich waters is ample time to transform every surface of the wreck into a sunken garden. An eerie place for humans, but a congenial dwelling place, it would appear, for restless demons seeking vengeance upon those who slaughtered the great spirits of the sea. Like the ruins of war, the ship lies crushed and humbled, a skeleton that today betrays little hint of the deadly life that it once led. Frozen where it came to rest, the machinery of death sleeps in the ghostly gloom, while schools of lively spirits seek sustenance and safety in its shadowed promenades and passageways. Garlanded in corals and sponges, the wreck is now a living reef and a monument to modern man's blind folly in laying waste the gifts that he was given. If dreamtime spirits still stalk the seas and shores of wild Australia, they may well be dismayed to see the way this world and all its wonders have been treated. Collecting oysters for their pearls was once a booming business in Western Australia. But as with whaling, the demand wiped out the supply. The solution for a few enterprising entrepreneurs like these on the northwest coast has been to farm the oysters, collecting them on the reef, then seeding them to produce pearls. In the lab, the oyster's shells are carefully pried apart with a pair of calipers. And then a nucleus made of nylon is strategically inserted in the shell between the mantle and the oyster's body. The seeded oysters, now attached to a rack, are hung on sturdy lines and returned to the sea near the place where they were first collected. Here the pearls will slowly form, while the farmers wait, thankful they did not take up this trade when pearling was a far more perilous art. In the early years of the century, dozens of divers, most of them Japanese, gave up their lives in the desperate quest for pearls. Some died of shark attacks, some of the bends, but all might have lived if they knew of pearl farming as it's practiced today. 18 months after seeding, the oysters are ready to harvest. Inside, beneath the mantle, is the object of the effort a cultured pearl. Up and down the western coast, surfside pearl shops cater to the consumer eager to avoid the middleman. Made by the oyster from secretions of calcium carbonate, the pearl has resisted all efforts to replace it with man-made synthetics. It is in quest of such riches and more that a growing number of visitors are finding their way to the wilds of Western Australia. Lonely shores, deserted bays, 
and camel rides in the sunset. Plus some of the best diving locales on the earth. All of these lure nature lovers to Western Australia. Attractions abound for the explorer, from the Kimberleys to the Southwest Cape. But of all the destinations along the western coast, one of the most popular by far is the beach at Monkey Maya. Here, for decades, flocks of tourists have come for a close-up encounter with wild bottlenose dolphins. For the dolphins, the rewards are obvious. Lunch, with no need to work for it. But there is evidence here of an urge for a deeper communion, of a need to return to a closer rapport with the wild. In quest of that communion, underwater explorers set their course for Busselton Jetty on the deep southwest coast. In the cool waters here, wetsuits are needed, and the best diving is during the night when the pilings of the jetty play host to some of Australia's most unusual and exotic marine life. With the aid of lights, the divers descend into a gallery of wonders where great hoary columns loom, clothed in a mantle of living creatures more fanciful by far than any imagined in fable or tribal lore. Like funeral flowers, delicate corals cluster here where the continent comes to its end, in a place of ancient magic and of eerie splendor. A stingaree, startled by the light, burrows in the sand, while a crab, surprised away from cover, does its best to disappear. Wearing coats that closely match the sandy sea floor, Rays of several species course tirelessly through the night, searching for small creatures unwise enough to be afoot. Unsuspected jungles thrive along this deep south coast, and hidden caverns tempt the curious explorer. Written on the walls, the record of a billion years of evolution, if only we had eyes to read its wisdom and time to listen to the tales the creatures of the sea could tell us. Like archaeologists probing the past, the divers probe this hidden world at the ends of the earth, marveling at its beauty, puzzled by its secrets and its mysteries. As those who first came to this land knew long ago, the living world holds all the art, the science, all the knowledge that we need. Within its tangled web lies all the knowledge that we lost and now must set forth once again to rediscover. <laughs> 